Todos los trabajos en la Comisión de Hacienda, Asuntos Federales y Junta de Control Fiscal. En esta ocasión para oír la ponencia de The 2022 Act Society. Eh, you have a, a provisto la presentación tanto en inglés como en español. I guess that as Celia Cruz used to say, I guess that, you, that your Spanish is not very good looking. Yes, that's true. But if you want to try, in, in, in Celia's case, she used to say that her English was was not very good looking. So you want to give it a try in Spanish? Uh, sorry, is okay? Can I take Yes. Okay. Sí, okay. Vamos, vamos a proceder con la lectura. En, o con, vamos a, a leer, va a estar ya para el record, se va a dar por leída. Vamos a darle la oportunidad para que haga los comentarios. Please identify yourself okay. for, for the record. Okay, gracias. Uh, buenas tardes, mi nombre es David Nisman y yo vivo en Puerto Rico desde el año 2014. Soy a vivir en Santa Cruz, Islas Vírgenes, uh, por 27 años antes de Puerto Rico. Un lugar donde fui el autor de algunas de las leyes de desarrollo económico pa, uh, para las Islas Vírgenes. Siempre hemos admirado la labor del Congreso de Puerto Rico porque han creado algunas de las mejores leyes en la nación, tales como la primera ley de condominios, ser los primeros en un adaptor en la ley de cooperación, las LLC en series, y las varias leyes de desarrollo, desarrollo económico de Puerto Rico. En las Islas Vírgenes, hemos reconocido a la legi legislatura de Puerto Rico como una legislatura verdaderamente de avanzada, estudiando las mismas para mejorar nuestras leyes. Y por eso voy a causar daño a, a ustedes, orejas, con mi español, lo siento. Uh, y si tú me permites, voy a seguir en inglés. Eh, no. Sí, hay algún... Sigo. Ok, but before going, uh, uh, shifting to English, let me ask you a question. Okay. Uh, you are the you are representing representing the society as what the vice president president? No, I'm just a representative. I'm somebody that has an Act 22 decree. Okay, you have what type of operation in Puerto Rico? Just Act 22 or Act 20? Or, okay, or? so I I have I am one of the owners of a company called Export uh, Services Strategies, and uh, and that's an Act 20 company. And I'm an investor in a number of different companies. A couple of them I'll speak about. In fact, I, I brought some of the people here, not to speak, but just to, to show you, okay? Um, so that's, that's my So capacity. you are a grantee on both uh, Act of 22 decrees, and both yeah. 20. Okay. I'm not using the Act 20 decree right now. I'm paying my full taxes. Um, but uh, we do have that company. The company is active, but we, we're not taking the benefits, okay? Um, okay, go ahead. Okay, and uh, antes de eso, yo era el fiscal federal en las Islas Vírgenes. Yo escuché de uno de tus uh, preguntas sobre um, la gente que abusar el sistema y yo tengo experiencia con eso en las Islas Vírgenes. Um, but what are, it's okay in English? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, what I really came was, was to make a single point here today, and uh, it's, it has to do with something that we haven't really talked about yet. In other words, we talk about statistics, you know, how many jobs are created by these various laws, what kind of investments have occurred in Puerto Rico. But one of the things that, that has struck me the most, because be before I became an entrepreneur, I represented a lot of these people for about 15 years, first in the Virgin Islands, and then I brought a lot of business to uh, Puerto Rico with the Expert Service Strategies Company. And what I think that we haven't thought about yet is what is the effect of serial entrepreneurs on a community, particularly a, a community that is in need of economic development. And so I wanted to speak about that for a moment. Serial entrepreneurs observe the community in which they live and they see both weakness and opportunity. They see unsolved problems, unmet needs, and they immediately seek to produce solutions to these problems. Now, it's profit. there's a profit motive. They, they want to make money. But 
they are willing to take the risk of investing their money and their time to create solutions to unmet needs. I, I first got this idea, not from, from myself, but when in the Virgin Islands, I, I met this Danish entrepreneur who was looking at the tax laws of the Virgin Islands. And he said, you know, we used to have something like this in Denmark. I think it was in conjunction with the, with the EU and with England. So if you lived outside of Denmark, you could, you could take a tax benefit because they had the territorial tax system. And he said that what Denmark uh, ultimately viewed as the cost of this was not so much the loss of tax revenues from these people. What they, what they lost was the, the loss of their ideas, the loss of the businesses that we, they would create. Because one thing about serial entrepreneurs is that they're always thinking about business. They always want to create something new. So the, the more serial entrepreneurs that we can attract into the community, and I'm not saying how to attract them, whether it's Act 20, Act 22, 73, or something completely different, okay? But what we should recognize as a truism is that the more serial entrepreneurs that we have in this community, the more economic activity they will create, okay? And that, that's important because and, and when we start thinking about, well, do we want really big entrepreneurs? Do we want small ones? One of the things that I observed in the Virgin Islands was that if a billionaire came and started a business, he wasn't offering pieces of that business to his employees or to people in the community. But when you brought smaller entrepreneurs together, they don't have the power to do this themselves. So they have to combine with other people. And those are the people that will create the opportunities for people inside the community. Because one, one of my, you know, my particular issues is that I don't think we ought to have any tax laws that only favor a certain group of people, okay? And I think there's a way to do this that brings a lot, lot more people in. Now this morning, one of my clients who was here earlier, his name was Greg Powell. He has a company called Ad Practitioners. And uh, we helped bring him here from California. He used to work for Google. And then he saw a way to turn what he learned at Google into a successful business in terms of internet marketing. When he first came, we were trying to figure out how to create three jobs, because at the time that was the law, that you had to have three jobs, you had to create three jobs for, for Act 20. And we figured it out, we got it done, and he's been here less than five years. And the beautiful thing is that now they have 122 employees. And this was Act 20 company, so not, not 22, but 22 did play a part in this because what he did was, because it was a growing business, he started offering a form of partnership or ownership in that business to his employees. So of those 122 employees, 40 of them are now partners in the business. And a lot of them, a lot of those people came for Act 22, because um, I, I know because when they came, this is what they talked to me about. And of, the, of, the, of those people, 70% of them are Puerto Ricans, okay? So that, that's a, that's a, there may not be enough of those success stories, but that, that's a great success yeah, story. But I, but I think there's also a, a big difference between the <coughs> entrepreneur that reaches the island, attracted by the business environment and by the possibilities of using Puerto Rico as a place to market his, his services or products, versus the entrepreneur that reaches the island because of some preferential rates on passive income. Uh, yes, yes, I agree with you. I agree with you. So what, what I wanted to do was to tell you my story, um, and I, I won't take a lot of time, uh, but uh, I, I'm, I'm blessed here because the, the, the genius behind one of the companies who is a permanent resident of Hungary, hung, Hungary, Hungary um, is in Puerto Rico right now today because we're, we're starting this business. And I said, come to the legislature, watch how our democracy in action. And so I, I would just like to introduce Mr. Tomas Gaspar. Okay. And next to him is Mr. Tomas Dosi. Okay. And they, they figure in this story. Okay. So before, before getting into the story, uh, since you are part of this fraternity the fact 22 within that group uh, do, do, do you have any concerns as to the use and abuse of this act how, how, yes. how the, the yes I do, do you want to hear them yes please okay. well 
my concern about Act 22 is that there's just no borders on it. You know, there's no, no hay frontera. You know, there's just no rules. And when I was bringing business here to Puerto Rico, one of the things that I always said to my clients in the beginning is, well, do you understand that this isn't for free? You know, Puerto Rico isn't giving you this for nothing, okay? That the purpose behind this law is to create investment in Puerto Rico. And then I would go through a little bit of the history about how Puerto Rico is one of the first places in the country that used public financing. It's how we got the Caribbean Hilton and that it- I, I, I synthesize your phrase of, of for nothing by saying that this program works on the theory of the candle. You light up a candle and pray <laughs> yes. that the Act 22 investor makes, <laughs> decides to make an investment. Yes, and, and I think that to have some rules that would force this to happen, to encourage this to happen, you know, would be a very good thing. Um, so what I, what I continually said to my clients was that if I'm gonna represent you, if I'm gonna help you with federal tax compliance, which is mostly what I did, I had a Puerto Rican partner, a lawyer, who would do the, uh, the DDEC side of this and I would provide federal tax compliance assistance. And what I would say is, you know, we're not gonna represent you unless you make a commitment to make investments in Puerto Rico. And, uh, and, and I think that that is one of the ways in which the, uh, the fledgling uh, medical cannabis business got started here. I, I had some clients, they were listening to me. Every month they would call me, do you think we should invest in this? Do you think we should invest in that? And eventually, they put eight to ten million dollars into one of the first cannabis companies in in Puerto Rico, and they were the first ones to get plants in the ground, the first ones to get product to the market, and that definitely helped get get the industry started here. Let me ask you: Do you have any idea of what are the different profiles of the members of the fraternity? I, I think in, 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 in terms of on, on a okay. big picture basis. The, the entrepreneur, the active entrepreneur, the, the trader, the, you know, what, what, what are we talking about? And you know, I don't, I don't know how to answer that question. I think Enid might be able to. I mean, I can just tell you anecdotally what I see, but I don't really have, a, have any statistical the, the, you don't have information. The data. Yeah. Yeah, so, en español. Sí, en Hola, mi nombre es Enid Concepción y soy la directora ejecutiva de 2022 Hack Society. En cuanto a la membresía y sus miembros ahora mismo, nosotros roughly tenemos 400 personas, un poco más este, de los 3.600 decretos que hay aprobado. Este, de todos los miembros te puedo decir que tenemos de todo. Tenemos desde 273, tenemos... ¿Qué es 273? El 273 es de IFI, la, el banking, el decreto 273. Incentivos de, incentivos de Tenemos los ley 22, tenemos los ley 20 y tenemos dos o tres eh, médicos que se han decidido también unir. El asunto con la membresía en cuanto a, a los Act 22 es que varía. Hay diferentes, desde los que vienen como entrepreneurs, comunidad de negocios, como mencionó David ahora mismo, o Greg, eh, que llegó saliendo del mundo de la mentalidad de ser un esclavo corporativo hacia ser un este dueño de su propio negocio y crear una historia como la de él. Este, tenemos los traders que, pues, Es un negocio muy eh, exitoso en Estados Unidos y que pues no es la mejor idea de tenerlo aquí en Puerto Rico, pero están pasando la mejor y están gastando dinero aquí en nuestra isla. Y tenemos también personas que son dueños de compañías Act20 que tienen sus ganancias de capital que las utilizan como Act22 en sus otras inversiones. Porque okay, para el récord, eh, las exenciones que da la ley 22, la ley 22 exime 100% de intereses y dividendos y entonces da unas trazas preferenciales para ganancias de capital. Eh, establece unas reglas que en el mundo corporativo contributivo se llaman anti-stuffing rules o sea que no puede no puede eh, rellenar el pavo antes de llegar aquí para matarlo en el sentido de que no puedes tener un portfolio de, 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 de valores venderlo durante tu residencia en Puerto Rico y esperar tener una tasa contributiva favorable se establece un periodo de enfriamiento de 10 años para entonces poder santificar esas esa ganancias. Este, pero básicamente son ingresos pasivos, ¿verdad? Excepto en el caso de, de un, un, una persona que se dedique activamente a, a la compra y venta de valores, que ahí sí entonces su actividad se eleva a nivel de, un, de lo que se llama un, en inglés un active trader business. Keep on. Sí. Keep on. 
Or I'm not following it, so you have to translate. <laughs> okay. He was just asking about the type of the membership okay. base, so you can go on oh, with okay. what you were saying. I, I know, okay. well, sorry, I know oh. I was speaking too fast for you. For your. <laughs> um, so it, it, I just wanted to tell you this very short story about, just to give you an example of how entrepreneurs come together and, and how Act 22 has fostered that business environment to let those combinations happen. So I'm going to just talk very briefly about three companies. They're all startup companies, so there's no great statistics behind them because they're just starting out, you know. So the, the three that I would like to mention to you, the first is Free Wind Energy, which is a, a company that has the, the, the greatest, most disruptive technology in wind turbines. And um, in fact, uh, the inventor is with us today. That's Mr. Gaspar who stood up. And, and it's a great example of, of, of just like the early American inventors, you know, who, who it was 99% perspiration to create this product. It took him 106 tries before he created this truly disruptive technology. I saw it in a factory in Luquillo several years ago because the other Tomas, the gentleman seated, seated all the way to, to my right, uh, is an Act 22 recipient. He came and formed a paint company with several other people. And it was at that paint factory that I saw this wind turbine operating. We got to talking. It, it was such a brilliant device. Then I had the opportunity to meet Mr. Gaspar, who, who was visiting here. And for the last two years, we've, we've worked on trying to figure out how to start this company. And finally, it's now happening. And one of the things that I think that we should be doing with these acts is figuring out, one, how to create the greatest value for Puerto Rico, but then secondarily, because it serves Puerto Rico's interest, if we focused on some industries that create strategic value to the United States, then what happens in Washington is instead of having this toxic situation that we have right now, what you see is, wow, we don't want to touch that program. Look at what it produced, OK? That, that's where I think we should go. Going back to your first point, okay. adding value. Yes. As a society, do you have any specific recommendations or you are inclined toward any given position regarding how to improve Act 22 in order to, to add value to its current well, you know, I, I'm in a bit of a representative capacity here, so I, I'm, I'm a little nervous about talking about that today because I, I would just be sharing my personal views on this and not the society's views, you know. And I know Rob Real, who is who formed the society, uh, is very open to amendments to this law and to figure out ways to make it better for Puerto Rico. But he got stuck in Europe because of the COVID restrictions, so he, he couldn't be here today. So. You know, if you would permit me, I would be happy to, to, to meet you and discuss this with you anytime because I do have a lot of ideas that I, I would like to discuss with you in terms of how we can make this better, you know, um, and how so, we can so, put some... So this document doesn't include any, any recommendations? No, uh, no, I'm just telling you my personal story with respect to, to Act 22. So anyway, we got the U.S. government excited about free wind energy. Why? Well, you understand they're focused on green energy right now, and uh, they're putting a lot of money into that. And so we were able to get a, a, a work visa for, for Mr. Gaspar, very, very difficult to obtain, and, no, and the immigration th lawyers thought we wouldn't do it. But I think the U.S. government saw the value in this. They granted the visa, and you know, as of one week ago, Mr. Gaspar is here with us. The gentleman that was seated next to you, I, 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 it was hard for me to read the names, but I, I think it was Senator Vargas. Was Vargas that? Milo. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I was listening to him when he was talking about how, hey, look, these programs just aren't getting into some of the smaller communities. You know, Well, I'm happy to tell you that Free Wind Energy is going to locate in Aguas Buenas, and we're going to have a factory there. And I understand that that's a town that's really in need of economic development, although I don't know that much about it yet. Um, but the reason we're going there? is because of DDEC, okay? And DDEC has also been very helpful, and Pridco in this instance, uh, they found the factory, they're giving us a lease for this factory, it's abandoned, there's nothing in it except garbage right now. Um, but they've been extremely helpful, you know, and I think that this is the kind of industry that they want to see happen. I'm glad because that's my family's town. Is that right? Great, well, so. hopefully we'll do some good things there, you know. Um, so 
so, so that's, that's free wind energy, and there you could see that, that this could be an example of strategic importance to the United States. I think one of the lost opportunities, I say this as an outsider who watched this from the Virgin Islands as this was developing with 936, but I think that it was an unfortunate thing that Puerto Rico never really got the credit for all these drugs that were created, you know, these miracle medicines that were created in Puerto Rico, and I think what we should do this time around is to make sure that when something good is created in Puerto Rico, that that is publicized, that that is known, that, that we can take advantage of that in Washington. Because I can tell you, I worked for the federal government most of my life, and, and this is how they think. This is how the agencies think. You know, it's like, so, so I get to the, to the next two companies that tell, which finish the story here. Please, and, and, and make it short. Okay, I'm almost done. I'm almost done. So the two other startup companies, uh, one is called Jewel, J-O-U-L-E, E-P-C, and the other one is Rubidex. Okay, I don't have anything to do with Rubidex, but Jewel is a company where, so I was representing a client. I was making him make those investments that I told you about. He bought 21 properties here, uh, commercial properties, invested a lot of money, and then, and then uh, did a lot of rehab on them. Then he brought his brother-in-law down, a gentleman by the name of William Solomon, who I mentioned in my testimony. He was a big-time builder in the States, and that's what he thought he was going to do, come down here and build hotels. He comes down here, and just like the, the, I say about serial entrepreneurs, he starts studying the community. He saw that the greatest need here was to improve the infrastructure. So he starts reaching into his network and starts bringing the greatest level grid engineers, or I should say grid level engineers to Port in the world to Puerto Rico. These are guys that fixed Con Edison's electrical system in New York. They're working on PG&E right now where that town blew up, Parad uh, Paradise in California. They were also involved in the Palm Islands project in the United Arab Emirates. And they're moving to Puerto Rico Jewel is not going to be a tax incentivized company. Jewel wants to do work here in Puerto Rico. So there aren't going to be any tax benefits there, Visa Act 20 or any of these other things. But these engineers have moved here even without contracts, without jobs. And one of the things that attracted them was Act 22. You know? So um, I'm hoping that we're going to be able to create something like a little Bechdel here with these great geniuses. You know? um, but in the meantime, Working with Jewel, we run into another Act 20 tour, a man by the name of Eric, Sw Eric Swider. He has a company called Rubidex, and this gets back to the strategic value question. Rubidex has a type of software right now, a cyber, a, a cyber security software that could eliminate these problems that are going on with these utilities in the states. So we had the Jewel engineers examine this software. Is it real? Will it work? You know. And to my astonishment, they were all very, very positive about this. And they said, yeah, this will do it. So imagine that if we get this going, the relationship is that Jewel would market Rubidex's software to these, utility, these big utilities in the United States. If that happens, if we can solve that problem for the United States right now, Puerto Rico needs to take the credit for that. Right. Can you imagine? I mean, this is, this is the biggest pro, you know, security problem the United States has today. And if that solution gets created in Puerto Rico, we can't miss this opportunity of taking credit for it. Okay? Um, because those are the things that, that, that build a lot of value and liaisons in, in Washington. You know? So that's really you know, my story. Uh, I'll end with this. And I'll have Enid get you this letter. I, I, I pulled it up on my telephone. Uh, governor John DeYoung was the governor of the Virgin Islands uh, uh, through, I think, January 2015. He, was, he served for two terms, eight years. And after you passed Act 22 uh, in 2012, um, the Virgin Islands studied that, and that became one of his number one priorities you know, with the Interior Department. You know, unlike Puerto Rico, all the other territories are somewhat governed by the Interior Department of the United States, the Insular Affairs section. So all those other ter territories have to go through the in Interior Department to, to make their wishes known to the Executive Department. So Governor DeYoung writes to the, uh, the Assistant Secretary of the Interior in early 2014 after, after looking at Act 22 and begging the Interior Department to get Treasury to issue a regulation that would you know, exempt us from Section 865 of the tax code. 
um, so that we could have the same benefits over there. So the, the point that I'm making is, yeah, th this law needs some changes. This law needs to, to have some teeth put into it. But it's a great law. And you know we're, we're suffering like, like the Caribbean always suffers economically, the US Caribbean. But you know we have some really good things working for us right now. We got all that money that's come down for infrastructure. If we use it wisely, you know, we can really turn Puerto Rico into sort of a state-of-the-art place. You have all these economic development laws, and the problem with getting rid of them too early in a cycle is you don't give them long enough to see what they can do for a community. And, 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 and this is where I get very anti-federal, because what I've done is I've studied the economic history of the United States and Puerto Rico, the economic history of the United States and the United States Virgin Islands. And what happens is, you know, they gave us these tax benefits because they didn't want to pay for our local governments when they created them at the time that we came into the union. And, and every 20 years or so, they pull the plug. They change it on us. And we have to start over again, over again. So I think if you amend Act 22, it's going to be a powerful sign to Washington, hey, these people in Puerto Rico are on the ball. They're looking at this issue. They're making sure that they're not going to be abuses. They're making sure that it will contribute to the economic development of Puerto Rico. And that uh, you know, we will get some points for that in Washington. You know? and, I, and I do think that if you do that, and if you get behind these laws, one of the important lessons I learned in the Virgin Islands was that the government of Puerto Rico really has to stand up to Washington and defend these laws because the Virgin Islands missed their opportunity. And when they, when they didn't stand up, and I was the one on the other side of this. I was the one that was prosecuting the tax abusers. You know? but, but, I w but I was also told, don't destroy the economy of the Virgin Islands. And so when I would speak to Treasury and say, look, this is an important program here, because the Interior Department supported it as well. You know what they said? Yeah, we hear, we hear you, Dave. Where, where is the Virgin Islands on this? You know, they were silent, you know. And so then, in the middle of the night, in the Jobs Act in October of 2004, this is when we got Section 937 of the tax code. And it, and it was basically done because of the perceived abuses in the Virgin Islands. Thereafter, the Virgin Islands figured this out. They put a lobbying effort together, and they stopped every change that the IRS wanted on, on these tax laws, uh, including getting some very good ones, like the 30-day travel rule, which was good. We also got uh, notice 2676, which helped develop a uh, technology sector in the Virgin Islands. And, and this is where we should go as a community. You know, we, should, we should be strong, and we should help the US. We should help Puerto Rico, and, and we'll do really well. And the final good news, I think, with our economy is, um, and, and I think we really have to watch this issue, is the um, supplemental Social Security case right now that, is, uh, that may go to the Supreme Court. If Judge Torwella's ruling is upheld, okay, this will bring an additional $2 billion a year into this community. You know? And that's recurring revenue every year, every year, every year. I think with all of these things working together, we really could turn the economy of Puerto Rico around. And I look forward to being a very tiny, small part of that. You know? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for your comments, David. Yeah. Any questions? Okay. All right. Well, thank you. That so, was easy. That will be it. <laughs> I was so, so muy nervioso para testificar hoy. So, gracias. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, David. And um, any comment? No, o sea, realmente durante el, eh, las primeras ponencias por la mañana se discutieron las estadísticas. Lamentablemente, la información que nosotros eh, le dimos a ustedes fue data antes de que salieran los nuevos estudios. So, todo lo que les sometimos está outdated. En, si nos dan un breakcito, se los podemos tratar de poner un poco más actualizado con lo que salió el viernes del DEC y el Tax sí, Expenditure del 2018. Por favor, ¿cuánto tiempo necesitan? Esta semana. Cinco días laborables. Cinco días laborables, perfecto. Sí, porque fue que el, el Tax Expenditure... Eh, Identificate, sí. Sí, para récords. Mi nombre es Jorge Cuilan y trabajo como analista contributivo para el Act 2022 Society. Parte de lo que se estaba citando en, en la ponencia era el Tax Expenditure Report del 2017 y pues el del 2018 salió. Sí, me extrañó que, que me mencionaron el del 2017 porque sí. hace como tres semanas salió el otro. Sí, pero ya habíamos sometido, así que tendríamos que suplementar okay. lo que ya sometimos, si, si es posible. Ok. Gracias. Thank you, David. Gracias, Gracias por la oportunidad. Thank you. Siendo las 3 y 20 de la tarde, eh,
damos por terminado la vista pública eh, del, sobre el proyecto de la derogación de la ley 20 y 22. Dice, la Comisión de Hacienda, Asuntos Federales y Junta de Control Fiscal cierra sus trabajos por el día de hoy.